the story that I have for you all tonight is full of mystery and intrigue and genetic engineering and depending, thank you, okay, yeah, <laughs> let's have that again. And depending on how you look at it, um, a whole lot or very little of the color blue. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so the Blue Rose Challenge was a synthetic biology project um, that got started in the 90s, but to fully understand it, we have to think about the color blue in the first place because um, this is where I get to sneak a little bit of neuroscience into the story because it was my first love. Um, but in your eyeballs, in your human eyeballs, you have a couple of cells that can... <laughs> 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 the way you said that. <laughs> I'll say again, human, yeah. human yeah. eyeballs. Yeah. <laughs> Not the sheep eyeballs in your, to in your pocket, your human ones. <laughs> yeah, the human ones that you carry in your head with you. Um, you have a couple of cells that can see um, a couple different colors on the visible light spectrum. They are red, yellow, and blue. Um, but there's actually a lot of blue things in the world that are not actually blue. You perceive them as blue. So whether or not they're really blue is for you to decide. That's not for me to tell you. Um, but I just want to take you through a couple examples of some things that look blue but are not actually blue. Um, so the blue morphos butterfly, not blue. The scales on this butterfly reflect light in a phenomenon called structural color such that it appears blue, but there's no blue pigment. Blue pigment, many pigments, are molecules that reflect light in such a way that you perceive color, and um, we'll get that to, to that later. Um, another thing that is not blue, blue jays. Not blue, I know! <laughs> but you their name, Casey. <laughs> Don't you feel misled? <laughs> <laughs> They're just jays. They're no. just <laughs> they don't even get a color. So, I'm glad we joke. Here's a human eyeball <laughs> again. <laughs> a human eyeball? <laughs> so blue eyes in people are not blue either. So in blue jays and eyeballs, it's just melanin. Or it's the absence of other um, pigments that make it look blue to your eyes. Um, so some things that are actually blue include um, the stone lapis lazuli. This um, was used, I think, first in Egyptian, ancient Egyptian cultures. It was um, found in the region that's Afghanistan today. It is actually blue. There's blue pigment in it. Um, and because it was so beautiful and rare, because blue is kind of special, we're finding, it became associated with royalty and deities. And so in Christian iconography, for example, you will often see the Virgin Mary depicted wearing the color blue because it was very special. Very special, okay? Um, so, fast forward from biblical times into the 1970s. Scientists. <laughs> a very exciting time, yeah, a small leap, a small bound. Um, scientists have figured out how to engineer life. They have figured out that microbes, tiny little things in the world all around us, um, can take in DNA from the environment in a process called bacterial transformation. And scientists have figured out how to manipulate this process to engineer life. They think they are gods, the hubris. Um, <laughs> and they have engineered synthetic insulin into bacteria. So this was the synthetic biology revolution. We think we can make anything. So some researchers at the Centauri Institute, a research institute in Japan, are like, we're going to make a blue rose. People love flowers. People love blue. The market for this will be crazy. <laughs> we'll make so much money. You can just like think back to the Dutch tulip. They like crashed a stock market of their own creating, I think. Um, <laughs> which I guess is what stock markets are. But <laughs> yeah, so they're like blue roses. They'll be wild. We're going to make it. So um, what you should understand before we get into what is clearly a challenging challenge um, is that there's a couple of pigments that make up floral color. So you know your chlorophylls, the poster child, they make green, they reflect green back at our eyes, they photosynthesize, it's awesome. Um, there's also carotenoids, you might know those because they make fall colors, also very special. There's the beta lanes, so they're responsible for um, red colors like in beets. And then your, there's your anthocyanins. Um, just like for the plot, this doesn't really, <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't really have anything to do with the story I'm telling you, but I assigned all of them inside out to characters. <laughs> Yay! And anthocyanins got fear <laughs> because the researchers who set out to make blue roses should have been a little more afraid of mess messing with this pigment class. Um, 
Because the thing with anth anthocyanins is, and all of these pigment classes, is that they're, they're classes of molecules, right? So they all have, like, there's different substructures that produce these specific colors. So there is an anthocyanin called delphinidin that makes blue. And there is even blue flowers. I mean, mostly blue flowers. These are forget-me-nots. There's other ones. So you have seen mostly blue flowers. That is real, I promise. Um, <laughs> but the thing with anthocyanins is that there's others that make reds and pinks. And so the rose genome, like all roses, do not have the gene for delphinidin in them. It's just not there. And so the researchers were like, no problem. Re uh, roses already produce other anthocyanins. We'll just make a quick substitution. It'll be fine, and the roses will be blue. Not so. It was not so. So <laughs> they figured out that there's a part inside the cells that make up the rose petals, this little thing called a vacuole, which is a big fluid filled sac in plant biology that gives the cell structure, and it also has a pH. And so that's where the pigments are for rose petal color. And no matter what you put inside the vacuole, whether it's delphinidin or one of the other anthocyanins, the pH makes it turn to be more like a red or a pink anthocyanin. And so they kept putting delphinidin into the rose genome. Also, editing plants is really, really hard. Like bacteria like to take up DNA from the environment, but when you edit a plant, um, it's very difficult. It's a very arduous process. You have to use another bacterium to infect the plant tissue. It's a whole thing. So very difficult. So they just keep putting blue into the rose. It takes them like 20 years. But eventually, I know, piece of cake. <laughs> 20 years, but <laughs> they were really, really determined to do this. Um, and so along the way, they learn a lot of things, actually, really useful stuff about plant biology, about plant synthetic biology. Um, and in 2002, they announced to the world that they have created a blue rose. Woo! I know. Do you want to know what they called it? You won't guess. It's too hard. Um, <laughs> they named it Applause. What? I wish. <laughs> okay. Guys, Bruce. this is not blue. <laughs> is it blue? No. no. Okay, you and I are not the first to point out. It's a little purple. <laughs> it's a little purple. So, look, I'm not here to dunk on researchers at all. Like, in this economy, like, no way. <laughs> I'm not here to do that. <laughs> Please. Um, I'm just saying, it's not blue. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't know, not blue. That's, that's, I just, the blue rose challenge, pretty challenging. Um, but they market this, you can buy it, it's called Applause, and there's this like whole story <laughs> on their website about how they did the thing. Um, so anyway, more recently than that, some other researchers were like, okay, you know, now that we know that you can't just put the gene for delphinidin or another blue pigment into the genome of the plant, like what if we edit the whole pathway, the whole pH-related enzymatic pathway that leads to the color change in the first place, and we just make it blue. And so in 2018, another team of researchers um, published something in, I think, the American Chemical Society or something like that, and they were like, guys, uh, we <laughs> did it. We made a blue rose, and this is how we did it. We edited the whole pathway. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> Applause. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. The emperor has no clothes. Uh. <laughs> Again, not here to dunk on researchers. Like, we learn really important things when we fail. <laughs> but and, I just, and these researchers have learned a lot. <laughs> they've learned a lot. I'm just saying, like, it's not blue. It's like a little blue. I, the, I don't know if you can see the color there. It's like a little more vibrant on your personal computer screen, maybe. But um, anyway, so I think, you know, uh, yeah. I think there's a couple lessons we can take from this. Um, first, the concept of doing something scientifically is like very different than the practice of doing it, right? And it's imp they're both complex, the ideas are complex, but then actually like manifesting it in the lab is very different. And so it's important to understand both, it's important to appreciate both. Um, but I think for me, when I learned about this and like, I think there's a place for reverence in the lab. Like this all started as a legend, right? Like, it was this mystical thing. R blue roses actually pop up in cultures around the world, like, dating back throughout history as this, like, symbol of unattainable beauty or, like, love or all these crazy fabled things. And so I just think 
if we take a step back and bring that folklore with us into the lab, we might just be like more efficient, you know? So thank you. <laughs>